Okay, so what we're going to talk about today is what is type 1 diabetes just overall in general? Uh, what is its effect on learning in school especially? Uh, what my personal type 1 diabetes story is? Uh, next is the challenges of exercise and diabetes and balancing that out and kind of how exercise affects exercise or diabetes and uh, diabetic emergencies which often come along with exercise. Glucagon, which is used for diabetic emergencies, and we're going to talk about the three different types that there are. And uh, next to last is medical devices, so pumps, continuous glucose monitors, and loop systems, and then the future of diabetes care. Okay, so type 1 diabetes is a chronic condition where your body really doesn't produce enough insulin to manage your blood sugar, which is maybe cause your blood sugar goes up when you eat sugar. Or carbohydrates and it goes down when you take insulin. So your body normally releases insulin through your pancreas, but in a diabetic case, the pancreas has been attacked by the immune system and is no longer able to create its own insulin. So you need to inject it in order to keep your blood sugar in range. And a possible cure for type 1 diabetes is a pancreas transplant, but it's kind of risky because sometimes your body will reject it and or you have to get a new pancreas every five to 10 years, which can is sometimes not worth it depending on how old you are in philosophy. Next up, how does it affect learning? So high blood sugars can cause processing abilities and a lack of memory, which can be really difficult on things like quizzes or tests at the end of the year where you need to have your memory unlocked and be able to remember things from the first day of school. And a low blood sugar causes brain fog, uh, inability to focus and shaking in your hands, which can affect your writing. And the inability to focus is really difficult when learning and trying to sit in the classroom and remember new content. And also rapid changes in blood sugar are kind of the worst because they're bulk. So you'll have kind of all of the different symptoms together. So if you're going up or down rapidly, you'll go from not being able to remember an answer to just not being able to understand what the question is, which makes it very good. So my type 1 diabetes diagnosis was December 14th, 2016. It's a big date in my life, but uh, I went to the doctors because I had lost around 30 pounds in a month. And I think I was down to about 104 pounds being five foot 10. So that was, that was a pretty frail body there. And uh, yeah, so I lost a bunch of weight, went to the doctor, they did a finger stick, and I was at 356, I believe, which is pretty high. And I had high ketones, which I'll talk about later, but that's also a very bad thing. And I spent, I believe, 36 hours in the hospital. And every two hours, they gave me a blood draw in either arm. They gave me three IVs because the first two didn't stick. And then I got a finger stick every 15 minutes for 36 hours. So kind of sore all over. And then as I left, they gave me a pamphlet on type 2 diabetes, which is a very different disease. So I was a little bit to the point of looking back on that, that they didn't prepare themselves better for a diabetic diagnosis. But after that, my father actually sent a letter to this professional soccer player named Jordan Morris, who plays for the Seattle Sounders, and he actually responded and sent me a letter about how to manage my diabetes in sports and just encouragement about diabetes in general and my diagnosis, which was super helpful, kind of inspired me to, to be a role model for other diabetics and to help people of, of, that have diabetes as well. So. He was great, and then this helped me find new role models. Marco Fernandez and Borja Mayoral are two Spanish soccer players. They play for my favorite soccer team, actually, and they both have type 1 diabetes, which I, I had no idea, and most people don't know until they've had diabetes and gone looking. And then another thing is Team Type 1. It's this foundation that I might become a part of. It's a scholarship fund as well. So I would be a part of a team of type 1 diabetic college athletes that go around the country and do events speaking to younger diabetic athletes and teach them how to manage their disease and that teach them that they cannot limit what they can do in sports and in life. So it would be a, a great opportunity if I got that. Okay, so diabetes and exercise. So high blood sugar can affect a lot of things in terms of exercise, but the one thing that can cause high blood sugar actually is high intensity exercise. So when most people think of high blood sugar, they think of you ate too much sugar and you go way up. But the problem is sometimes if you're running really fast or do playing a sport, it will cause an adrenaline spike that can raise your blood sugar actually and cause you to be dangerously high. And so that can lead to ketones or ketoacidosis, which is 
as other conditions I'm going to mention a little further down in the presentation, but it's, it's very dangerous, especially when exercising. And then it also, the reason your blood sugar goes up is really because of your liver releasing its sugar stores and your muscles releasing their sugar stores as well into your body, which causes your blood sugar to clearly rise and there's more sugar coming in. And so a low blood sugar can be caused by low to, in, low to medium intensity exercise. So that's walking, jogging, even lifting weights, things like that that are not super difficult, but just in the middle somewhere. They'll cause your blood sugar to go down as your insulin, it will raise your insulin sensitivity, so your blood sugar will go down when you take any sort of insulin. And that effect can actually last up to 48 to 24 to 48 hours after the exercise. So after a soccer game, I can have lows the next night at like 3 a.m. due to the game and the exercise that I've done previous to that. And the kind of things that happen with low blood sugar is slowed reactions. So when you're playing sports or doing any sort of exercise, that can be dangerous and just irritating when you can't move as fast as you want to, or you just feel kind of sluggish. And then sometimes it can lead to injuries if you think you can get to somewhere fast enough, but you can't, and then you step wrong and hurt yourself. So that's that's not good. And then there's also a risk of death. So if your blood sugar goes to a dangerous level, you'll go unconscious. And if no one knows how to administer glucagon, there's a chance that you, you could die. So it's always a, a bit of a risk. And then for my, for, this is my personal pre-exercise preparations that I do. So I've kind of evolved over time and changed them just so they can work best for me. But a temp basal decrease is what I do about 10 hours before the game. So that's decreasing the amount of insulin that I get continuously throughout the day in order to keep my blood sugar at a higher level. And so that when my insulin sensitivity goes up, I stay level and don't drop. And uh, I do a decreased carb intake about three hours before the game so that I'm not needing to take insulin because then if I have insulin in my system, I'll, I'll drop again, which is not ideal. And then carb loading, so it's kind of anticlimactic because you want to decrease the carb intake, but you also want to carb load because you need the energy. So about 12 to 24 hours prior to the game, I'll eat as many carbs as I can. That way my, my body's full of sugar, I'm ready to go. And then I can have that three hour fast basically before the game or the exercise in order to not go low. So it's, it's a little more than the average athlete has to do, but it, it's worth it. So the most common emergencies for diabetic are ketoacidosis and hypoglycemia. So ketoacidosis is caused usually by a high blood sugar for an extended period of time, or just a very, very high blood sugar for a short period of time. Uh, it's, it's caused usually by a lack of insulin. And so your body will then decide to use fat as fuel because insulin is really the key that lets the sugar from your blood into your muscles. And so when you don't have that key, you need something else to open up the door essentially. And that's the fat and muscles that it will burn up, put into your blood, and use as energy. And so when you burn fat and muscle, ketones become present. And you might know the word ketones from the keto diet, which is really just not eating enough carbohydrates to your body to manage. And then you'll use your fat stores as, as fuel. So for a normal person, that's OK. But for a diabetic, it's, it's dangerous with your blood sugar. And uh, hypoglycemia, also known as low blood sugar, a lot more commonly. And so symptoms, shaking, brain fog, sweating, irritability, hunger. There's a lot of other ones, but those are just the most common that most people experience. Also weird cravings. Sometimes you'll know, want chips with mayonnaise or something odd like that, but it's a mixed bag sometimes. But the worst things that can happen are unconsciousness or death. And usually it's unconsciousness then death. So if you go too low, again, don't get the glucagon. Your body can just get to the point where you don't have enough sugar to make your brain function, and then you'll just shut down and, and die. So that's not ideal. Glucagon is what can save you from that happening. Uh, so glucagon is used to release the sugar stores in the muscles and mainly the liver. And so it's kind of the same thing that happens naturally during high intensity exercise. So if you've been doing high intensity exercise, it's not good because sometimes glucagon will not be as effective. But there are three main forms of glucagon. There's a pre-mixed injectable glucagon. There's a non-mixed injectable glucagon. And there's also a newer nasal spray, which is nice if you don't want to have to get stabbed. And yeah, so you're supposed to use glucagon only when a diabetic is really unconscious because otherwise they can swallow sugar and, and do that on their own. So premix injectable glucagon, the newest type looks like this. It's a Chivo pen. It's kind of like an EpiPen in a way. You just hit it, there's no open needle. And it's it's pre-dosed, so you don't have to know how much to give the patient, which is great for school environments where there may not be a nurse present and a teacher has to do it, so they 
they don't know how much to do. So that's that's what that looks like. For a while, I carried this, but then once the nasal came out, I decided I'd rather take a, a nasal spray than an injection. So switch to that. And non mixed, I have a video for you that I created. It's from my uh, training video that I'll be submitting to the school after presentation. But this is just the the preparation of the non mixed gluten. So you can see in there they have the gluten. Oh, there's a powder in that little vial, and there's a liquid which is just saline solution in the in the uh, syringe here. So the, the biggest mistake that actually happens a large percentage of the time when administering glucagon this way is that people will be in a rush and forget to mix them. And if you're injecting the person with just the fluid, it's really just the same solution. And, and you can't take it back out and mix it. The patient will need other glucagon, which most times we do not have. So you mix it together by spinning it, and then you draw it back out. You're here. You can see. But it's a... Uh, with the process. And so there's also instructions on the inside of the container that you can see down there. And most, I think all forms of glucagon actually have some sort of instruction label on them of how to do it properly. So, and then at that point you would inject the glucagon. Let me get something back on here to see if that works. Okay. Here we go. So that's the non mixed glucagon. That's the original type, but that's becoming more and more less common. The, the nasal spray and premix is becoming more common because it's easier and just more simple to use. Here's some pictures that I took of my nasal spray. So you can't really read the label here, but you can see it has visual steps of what you have to do in order to use it. And so it comes in a little yellow container like this, and you crack off the lid and you pull it out, and it looks like this. It's pretty simple. You just put this part here into the patient's nostril as far as you can, and then you Click the button and it will shoot a powder actually, not a liquid, which is a little bit odd, but a powder into your nostril, which then will help the patient wake up. And that's that's the newest one of the gluten on actually. Okay, so the proper order of operations. This is an important thing that when I sent out kind of a quiz to a couple of staff members, most people actually got this wrong. So you might be tempted to immediately call 911, but unless you know and saw the patient go unconscious, you don't know how long they've been unconscious for. And being unconscious with low blood sugar for an extended period of time can be very dangerous. You can have permanent brain damage or just die, which is not the best situation. So you want to first do a finger stick, which I'll show you a video of once I'm done with the slide. And then if the patient's beneath 70, which is the marker of a low blood sugar, you want to, in most cases, the student's unconscious at this point, if they're, if you want to administer glucagon, you, you want to continue this process. If they're above 300, and they're unconscious, then you immediately want to call 911 and, and just have them deal with it because there's no immediate fix for that. And the next thing you want to do is locate their glucagon and see what form it is, if it's nasal, pre-mixed, or non-mixed glucagon, and just read the instructions and make sure you follow all the correct steps. The next step is to administer the glucagon in the form that it is, and then roll the person on their side so that when they wake up, they if they do need to vomit, they do not end up drowning in their own vomit or vomit all of themselves. And then you want to call 911 at this point because you've done everything you can. And then you next want to test their blood sugar around 15 minutes after you've done this process just to make sure that they're climbing. At this point, they should be regaining consciousness. And glucagon should only be used when a student is unconscious and unable to swallow. Usually, there are rare instances where it makes sense to give it to a patient when they're not unconscious. But if they're still able to swallow, they're still able to consume sugar, and, and you can just give them a juice box or something like that. And I'll show you a clip of a finger prick. This is another clip that is inside of my present or inside of my training video. So this is you know, some of the systems look a little bit different, but they usually have some sort of script and different container that you enter into a PDM, and it will tell you when and where to put the blood sugar or to put the sugar to measure the blood sugar. There you go. And as you can see on this one, it takes a second to load, but once you get your blood sugar, right here somewhere, there we go. You would not want to give me glucose on there because I'm clearly within my range and I'm supposed to be. If I were under 70 and unconscious, then you would you'd likely want to, unless I'd have some other, unless I have some other medical condition that causes me to faint or have seizures and things like that. Okay, so different medical devices that exist for diabetics. There's a continuous glucose monitor, which is a, you know, the CGM, 
And there's two main ones of that. There's a couple others that are being tested, but the, the big ones are the Dexcom and the Freestyle Libra. And I have some pictures of those on the next slide. And then an insulin pump is something that I have actually, and it is better than injections because you don't really have to inject yourself every two or three hours for meals. You can just click a button and it automatically gives you the insulin you need. So mm -hmm. it's pretty convenient. And there's two main systems. There's an Omnipod, which is a tubeless pump system. That's just an adhesive patch basically on your hip or your arm that will administer glucagon without any sort of extra tube. Versus the tube pump, which has a long, thin plastic tube that is around and they both have their positives and negatives, but I prefer the, the tubeless system, especially for athletics. And then something that's kind of in the future and currently being tested is a loop system. So I actually have one of these as well. Uh, I have the Rylink loop system, and the Omnipod loop system may be coming out in the next year or so, which would be very, very nice. But here is continuous glucose monitors. Here's two of them. So this is the freestyle lead right here. That little patch is what goes on your skin. I believe it's about the size of a silver dollar, the size and height of that. So it's, it's pretty small, but without you have to scan it in order to measure your blood sugar. So it doesn't instantly give you a readout unless you have an attachment that does that for you. The Dexcom, however, is it will give you a reading every five minutes, sent straight to your phone, and you can share those results with family members or medical staff at the school. So it's really convenient because they can see if you're going low or high without even doing anything you're sick. And then for insulin pumps, I have a picture of an omnipod here. The tube pump, I was just, I didn't get a picture of that one because I don't have one with me. But it has, it's basically a pager like device with a clip on it and a long, thin plastic tube that inserts into the body the same way. But with this, the omnipod it has this adhesive patch around the back of it and it's about yeah, maybe half an inch tall and, and maybe two inches long. And so in the front, there's a needle that is a soft, like cannula, it's known as. And so when it's injected, it has a very, very thick needle go into your skin and then come back out. And, during, and it leaves for a period of three days a plastic needle in underneath your skin. So it's, it's pretty great. And then loop systems. So here's my personal loop system right here, the, the Riley Link, which is not super convenient. I had to spend about six hours coding a whole app for myself in order to create this system. So there's this small company that's been making these and getting them FDA approved, and they were just, I believe they're going through testing, and I was part of the trial for that. And I think they're pending approval from the FDA. But the loops, the Omnipod loop system over here is the Dexcom and Omnipod, the two devices I actually have, are working together to create a loop system that has a pre-made app. So you just download the app from the app store, and then you instantly have a loop system with no other steps, which would be really great. Because even with the loop system that I have currently, it's not once and done. Every three months, I have to recode the entire app, which takes about six hours of my time, where I can't use my phone or my computer because they're both kind of running together creating that system. And the, the thing about a loop system is it basically, how it works is it, can, it has like a computer algorithm that controls your blood sugar, so it will increase your insulin or decrease your insulin based on where your blood sugar is going in your uh, readings from your CGN. So it will automatically make decisions to keep you inside of your range. And you just tell them you eat or exercise and how many carbs or how long you're exercising. And it will correct for that to try to keep you perfectly in, in the range, mm -hmm. which is it's great. It's almost like a cure. So the future of diabetes care, or what I see it to be, uh, is a fully autonomous loop system is what I think is going to come up pretty soon, so one where you barely even have to enter the cars you're eating, maybe you can take a picture of your food and they'll tell you, something like that, because it would just make it a lot more convenient and then it would be almost like you don't have diabetes in the first place. Um, an advanced loop system could be another way, which is a omnipod loop system, I think will be the future of that, so you don't have to code the app yourself and it's pretty convenient, as well as being reliable and effective. And then a possible cure, the pancreas transplant is the current possible cure, but it's it has its downsides with replacing the pancreas after five to ten years and possible rejection of the organ. I think eventually, I know they've been doing studies on printing your own organs out of your own DNA, like 3D printing them, and I think that could be a possible cure someday, probably many years down the line for, for diabetes. But another actually promising study that's happening is insulin beta cell transplantation. So they would insert the beta cells, which create insulin in your body naturally, into your pancreas, into the wall of your pancreas, so that you would be able to create at least a small amount of insulin on your own. 
and then you could cover for the rest of the small dose of insulin rather than major injections, which is a pretty exciting study. And then, uh, yeah, so there's kind of ever understanding, ever developing understanding of diabetes. And so there was a one study that came out of, I believe, England where there was an outbreak of type 1 diabetes cases in, I believe, teenagers, and they related it to getting COVID and weakening their immune system. And that caused them to get type 1 diabetes in the end. And so there's no conclusive study about it yet, but they, there was a large correlation between getting coronavirus as a teenager and having a weakened immune system and then developing type 1 diabetes, even if your family hadn't had it before that. And I want to thank my mentor, who's not able to be here tonight, but uh, Cheryl Holton, uh, nurse practitioner and diabetes educator. She helped me throughout this project and was great talking, was great talking to her about all the different diabetes technologies and her ideas and what she's learned uh, in her years as a nurse practitioner. And yeah, I want to thank her for her time and effort that she put into my project and helping me. And so in conclusion, uh, I think it's very important to have yearly training and testing of the knowledge of staff members and not just the medical staff in the school but all the teachers and i think this would ensure the safety of the diabetic students it would increase the confidence of parents and students in the school's ability to protect their child and it would also help the teachers be confident when they get into an emergency situation and uh yeah so i have a few personal examples of training not being where it should be in school so one time i was around 250 uh, which is of high blood sugar and I was going up rapidly and I asked if I could go take a walk and take some insulin and I was told that I'm not that high um, by a staff member and I reported that to the, to the administration and it was, it was dealt with but I felt it wasn't a very well-educated response from, from the staff member. And then one time I was also low and I it was a different staff member actually this time but I was at like 50 or 60 and eating some gummies and they told me to take some insulin which would, would kill me. So I chose not to do that. And 